Next up, we have the Karma half of Karma and Sense, Inc. She brings over 20 years of experience focusing on philanthropy-driven families and organizations who want to make a real change in their community. Please welcome Gina Rothstein. Before I get started, I just want to give a shout out to my nine-year-old nephew, Liam, who helped pick the pictures for this evening. <laughs> Good evening. We just finished celebrating the High Holy Days of the Jewish Faith, a time spent celebrating the start of the New Year Rosh Hashanah and seeking forgiveness for our sins leading up to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So it is only slightly ironic that I, a Jewish woman, is standing in front of you this evening talking about trials. We, as a Jewish people, come by the guilt complex honestly. The history of Jewish guilt can be traced back to the trials and tribulations of various family groups in the Bible. So it is no wonder that my line of work focuses on the family dynamics and strengthening connections between generations through strategic philanthropy and legacy planning. Over the next six minutes, I'm going to take you on a historical journey through Jewish guilt and how these lessons can be applied to the modern day family. <laughs> the first story I'm going to share with you is called, What Happened to the Other 5%? <laughs> From a Jewish perspective, we can link this sense of perfection to the story of Cain and Abel, two brothers who were fighting for God's affection. In this story, God isn't satisfied with Cain's sacrifice, so he chooses Abel, leading Cain to kill him in a jealous rage, thus leading to the first case of the not-perfect-enough child in Judeo-Christian history. <laughs> and every culture has one. In the Chinese community, it's called the Tiger Mom Complex. You know, when your kid comes home with a 95% and you ask, what happened to the other five? And I'm convinced this is why Jewish people like Chinese food so much, is because we have this commiseration on, Jewish, on the guilt factor. How we see this play out in families we work with is when inheritance and succession plans are predicated on the perfection of the next generation. The end result not only leads to dissension in the family, but also to a sense of guilt. Which leads us to the second trial, fair versus equal, and the story of Jacob and Esau. And we're not supposed to have favorites, but it's in this story that our matriarch, Rebecca, has a favorite, and it's her youngest son, Jacob. And she tricks her blind husband to give the birthright blessing to Jacob instead of to the elder son, Esau. An early documented case of Jewish neuroses, when Isaac feels compelled to still give a blessing to Esau, even though it's a, a, an inferior blessing. And so this begins the trial of fair versus equal, which begs the question, what does balance look like in a family where siblings have been equal in the family space, but not equal in the family business? The equal versus fair conversation is one my business partner, Richard Ouellette, and I have had with our clients when they are looking at transitioning family wealth from one generation to the next especially when the family business is involved. What does equal and fair look like if not all the children are working in the family business, yet all are benefiting from the success of that business? I'm the eldest daughter of three to a very hardworking set of parents, and I'm also part of a legacy of a pioneering Jewish family. So it's not lost on me, my roots and my history. I grew up in a gastronomic house of Jews, where science trumps religion and culture trumps science, and my mother's chicken soup is the best in the world. <laughs> but this also means that I grew up with the story of not enough, which means that if you've ever been to a Jewish home, that if there's no leftovers, there's not been enough food. And where this sense of not enough comes from is probably from the ingrained memories of the old country, when we lived in shtetls and had more of a connection to each other as a point of survival where we had to take care of each other because of external political pressures. And from stories told, life in the shtetl was a trial. The not enough mindset might also be tied to the ritual of Passover, where we are obligated to invite the stranger to the table for the festive meal. The meal that is shrouded in ritual and for the uninitiated could be quite daunting. 
At this meal, we serve traditional foods, so chicken soup, brisket, you know, the usual. And then we have gefilte fish. <laughs> so what is gefilte fish? It's the Jewish version of fish cakes made from various white fish with onions and seasoning rolled into oblong balls and then boiled. And then they're cooled in that water and it creates this gelatinous mass around the gefilte fish and you serve it cold with more boiled carrots and horseradish. <laughs> right? Um, and you serve this with matzah, which is a dry cracker that consumed over the course of the eight days has the opposite effect of prune juice. <laughs> so as you can see, when we invite strangers to our table, we do so with, again, a bit of dark humor, which is very much part of the Jewish irony and persona. Often during the legacy planning process, families ask us questions like, how much is enough? Are we doing enough? Will my kids have enough? Are we giving enough? We are in the early stages of North America's largest intergenerational wealth transfer. And this transfer of wealth will continue until about 2050. And so these questions are not just at the beginning, they're happening right now. Which means that we're starting to explore the question of what is enough. And it's not about good wealth planning, but it's about reflecting on a life lived and what, are the, what is the vision that we're passing on to the future generation. Some of the most exciting and interesting conversations with families is what they envision for their families and their community in the decades that are, when they're gone and what they want to do now to lay the groundwork for achieving that vision. Judaism is not just a religion. It is a culture, it is a way of being, it is a style of humor, and it is a way of expressing love. When we, as individuals, think about how we handle trials, our approaches are steeped in the cultures that shaped us and the tribes from which we originate. For me, my cultural orientation not only reinforces the negatives, but also supports the positives, like an overexpression of emotion of joy and sad, joyfulness and sadness. So the concept of trials from the Jewish perspective is not about suffering but about character building. It is ingrained cultural attitude that led me to the work that I do every day, supporting families as they tackle some of the most complicated relationships they will ever have, those of their family.